Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland Devo 30. I'm Pastor Ruben. Thank you for joining us today. We stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And if you're in the neighborhood, come on by and join us at 5383 Martin Street. And today we're starting a new little letter here from Timothy. <coughs> Paul's letter to his protege. And it's an important one. So let's go ahead and pray. Ask the Lord to minister to our hearts before we start our day. Gracious Father, we thank you for bringing us here to the, today, Lord, this morning. Those that are here in the church and those that may be watching, Father, uh, this morning or sometime uh, later, Lord. We pray your blessings upon us. You lead us and you guide us, Father, as we begin our day. And we thank you, Lord, that we're putting you first today. The Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, and everything will be added unto you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's see. Good morning, Patty. Glad you could join us. We're in 1 Timothy, and we're in chapter 1. So I want to give a little, little review before we get into chapter 1. <clears throat> Paul writes this letter. I'm sorry. Let me start here again. Um, am I in First Timothy? I'm in First Timothy, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I um, thought I had this here, but now I guess I don't. Um, I was going to give some background from my Bible here about Timothy and where he came from. Uh, since the early 19th century, the pastoral epistles have been attacked more than any other Pauline epistles on the issue of authenticity. The similarities of these epistles require that they be treated as a unit in terms of authorship because they stand or fall alone. The external evidence solidly supports the conservative position that Paul wrote the letters to Timothy and Titus. <clears throat> Timothy, um, I'm sorry, suggestions of an author other than Paul are supported wholly on the basis of internal evidence, even though these letters claim to be written by Paul. This letter was written um, while Paul was in prison, and it's written to his protege, Timothy, who is pastoring a church after Paul encouraged him to do so. And I was going to read some more, but I should have marked it as usual. I didn't, and now I'm lost in my notes here. So let's go ahead and just get into uh, chapter 1. Sorry about that. Oh, my fault. Let's start at verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ our hope. Uh, interesting point here. Timothy is probably mentioned more times than any other friend of Paul. He's mentioned quite often in the beginning of his letters or in the salutations of his letters. So that tells us that Timothy was very dear uh, to the Apostle Paul and he poured into him very much. I remember reading a book called Harvest by Pastor Chuck Smith and it's a testimony of all the first line pastors that he raised up in the ministry which include, uh, you know, John Corson, um, Raul Reese, Mike McIntosh, all of those guys uh, that uh, he poured himself into, and they became his front line, they became his board members, they became his, um, his voice, in a sense, out there in the beginning of Calvary Chapel. It's a good book called Harvest, and it gives you the testimony of each one of those guys. A really good read. Um, the evidence today of Paul, of Chuck pouring into them is, is really clear because these guys now are probably Chuck's age uh, when he uh, was pouring into them. And you can see that they have kept 
the philosophy that Chuck had out of love for Pastor Chuck, but yet still being uh, biblical pastors from the scriptures. So it's a good thing to have a protege and someone, you know, obviously who is willing, who is willing to um, submit under someone's authority. And boy, these guys have some great stories about Pastor Chuck and what he'd ask them to do. Um, I remember hearing one about Jack Hibbs, and Jack Hibbs was was um, concerned because someone wanted to start a Bible study in Chino Valley or Chino Hills area, and they started one. And Jack said, "Hey, Pastor Chuck, I, I want to talk to you. There's this Bible study in, in in Chino Hills, and they need a pastor and they need someone to teach the Bible. And so, um, just want to bring it to your attention." And he goes, "Well, then go ahead, go ahead, and teach it." And he was like. Me? He goes, yeah, go ahead and teach it. And you're just that quick, you know, uh, to just appoint someone to teach. And Chuck was like that. And so Jack uh, told that story, and it just shocked me uh, that Chuck would do that. But there were times when he did. He would oftentimes call him in the office and say, look, Mike, I've got this trip going on. I want you to go. He's like, you want me to go? Yep, I want you to go. And he would send them off. And they would go, you know, because they loved Pastor Chuck just as Paul loved uh, Timothy here. So he writes to Timothy, verse two, to Timothy, my true son, um, that word can mean uh, Genesis, you know? In other words, from the beginning, you've been my son, uh, lawfully begotten, not necessarily bloodline, but lawfully um, committed uh, to you in the faith. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. As I urge you when I went into Mesodania, remain in Ephesus that you may <clears throat> charge some that they teach no other doctrine, nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies which cause disputes rather than godly edification which is in faith. Now, <clears throat> he encourages them to be biblical, right? In other words, stick with the scriptures. All scriptures are inspired by God. And God has given us those scriptures that we could live by. Um, they are for encouragement, um, for strength, for correction, for all of those wonderful things that, that God uses scriptures for. Um, and so stick with the Bible and don't get off on a tangent. Don't get off on something other than uh, the scriptures. And I think that's safe because you can't really argue scriptures when scriptures are written very clearly, right? Right. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, whoever believes in him would not perish and have everlasting life. And if you just teach that, instead of teaching something like, um, you know, uh, there are many ways, and that might be someone's philosophy, you know, uh, there are many ways to God. Well, that's an error, and we can debate over that. And you can't say that it's an error to say that the Bible says God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son. You know, and whoever believes in him should not perish. And I think that if you stick with the scriptures, you'll be fine because the scriptures will speak for themselves. You don't have to speak for them or defend them. God will do a good job at that. But when you bring up your opinion, and oftentimes I, I do that, and I try to say this is my opinion, or if someone else brings up their opinion, then that's what it is. It's an opinion. It can be debatable, right? You can debate debate opinions. You can debate You can debate. Um, denominational doctrines, you know, that have traditions and, and so forth. You know, there's a big debate over baptism. Do you submerge or do you do sprinkle water? And there's a big debate over that instead of sticking with scriptures because the scripture shows every time someone was baptized, they were submerged. So you just stick with scriptures. And I think that's what Paul is saying here, Timothy. Don't, don't let the church, you know, move you or sway you in any direction. Just stick with scriptures. Uh, be faithful to it. You start getting into genealogies and fables and models and modes and <clears throat> things like that, then it's subject to interpretation, um, it's subject to preference. You know, we're all made differently. And there are people that, that like a certain model. You know, there are people that, that like the fact that they can go to a church and they become a part of the voting church. And they can vote now on things happening within the church where other people think, well, that's not biblical. God has always raised up a man to lead the church beginning with Moses, you know, with Paul, with Peter and the apostles and so forth. Yeah, they counseled with one another, but they always were led by God himself. And some uh, like that preference either. So there's debate over that, over those type of issues. So be faithful just to 
to uh, preach uh, the word, the scriptures. Now, verse 5. The purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith, from which some, having strayed, have turned aside to idle talk. Idle talk would be worthless uh, and fruitless words. There's no value to them at all. They're just uh, fruitless. <clears throat> Desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor the things uh, which they affirm. So apparently there were some religious leaders there, probably the Sanhedrin, uh, Pharisees or Sadducees that are still stuck in the law. Uh, they were stuck in genealogy. They were stuck in fables. They were stuck in tradition. And so Paul saying, look, these guys are stuck in, in, in that uh, form. And so you need to be pure in heart. You need to be of a good conscience. You need to be sincere in your faith, sticking with the word of God and not like these religious men. Verse 8, but we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. In other words, I was having a, this debate with somebody the other day. They kept saying, the law, the law is no good. And I go, no, the law is good. No, 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 the law is, we're not under the law anymore. And so you're saying you don't try to keep the Ten Commandments. No, I don't have to keep the Ten Commandments. I'm like, no, that's wrong. And that's wrong. The law, the law is good, as he says here uh, very clearly. Uh, the law is good. Why? Because it does what it's supposed to do. It, it's to reveal to you that you can't keep it. But we are to keep it. But we don't keep it for salvation. We keep it because they're great principles to live by, and they'll keep us safe and in communion with God. But we're not under the law, or are we going to be judged by the law? We're judged by the grace of God now because of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross for us. And that's such a concept to, to understand. It took me a while, just a lot of time of thinking about this. And I finally understood that when we keep the Old Testament principles that God has established uh, there or the laws, let's just call them the laws. We're keeping them because they're great principles to live by. We're not keeping them for salvation or to maintain salvation. And that's what the children of Israel thought. If I just keep these laws, then God's going to receive me. I'm going to be saved. I'm going to be okay. If that were the case, then why did he have sacrifices and offerings? There was no need for that. So if we just keep that in mind, then we understand that the law is good and that there are great principles in it, but it will not save us in that sense. It is not good. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy, the profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, uh, for manslayers. That, that, that surprises me when I, I read that. Murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers. That means that was taking place at that time. Mm -hmm. And Paul's making reference to it here that there are some that have murdered their fathers and their mothers. Uh, possibly turned them in because they were believers in Christ Jesus. You know, like Paul was going after the Christians, you know, and he would bring them and put them in prison. Some would get stole, stoned like Stephens and, and so forth. And so it could be that <clears throat> some of the Jews were turning in their own parents because their own parents uh, became Christians. And so that was one of the uh, struggles of that time uh, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers, and if there is any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. All these things are contrary to the gospel, not to the law, but to the gospel of grace. Uh, these are sinful characteristics of a sinful man that is under the law. And so the law shows that a sodomite is sinful. The law shows that kidnapping or a kidnapper is sinful, that one who lies uh, and shouldn't lie is sinful. So that's what the law does, and it's for those that are sinful. But the law is also for the believer in that it's a good principle to live by, but not to be saved by. <clears throat> he goes on in verse 12. And I thank Christ, Jesus our Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Now, that is a beautiful scripture there. 
uh, as it proclaims Paul's faithfulness and that God saw that faithfulness to put him into the ministry. <clears throat> I struggled with this verse for a long time because I always thought, well, then is it Paul's work that God put him into the ministry for? Or was it God's work in Paul that he put him in the ministry, right? Because it's God who works in us and through us, Philippians says. But yet here, Paul is saying, he found me faithful. So at the same time, we have to be faithful. I was reading a, an article this morning by Paul Tripp, and, and he was saying that um, we must endure, but it's not our endurance, it's the Lord's endurance. But yet you read all of our scriptures, all it tells us to what? Persevere, which is enduring. So somehow there is a, a co-work together that we do with God, that we have to be faithful, and yet he's the one that helps us to be faithful. I don't know how that really works. <laughs> I don't know how it works, but it, somehow it does. I know that in, at times of my life when ministry has been just too much and I've wanted to run, God doesn't let me run. And, and somehow he, he puts something in my path I've got to take care of. And I might not want to take care of it in a, you know, uh, with a perfect heart, <laughs> but I go ahead and I take care of it because he knows that I'm going to do it because I'm committed to, to doing that, but yet it's him who commits me to doing that. And so when Paul says it here, he's not boasting in his faithfulness. He's boasting in God's faithfulness because it was God who called him <clears throat> and has enabled us to. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent man, in other words, violently arrogant, that's what the word means, violently arrogant, uh, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief or unbelief. Um, <clears throat> violently arrogant or prideful. Um, the, I was driving down the street the other day and I was behind this SUV and it was driving erratic and slow and then fast. So I'm like, what, what's going on with this guy? You know, And I tried to move over a little bit just to see. And as I moved over, I could see him, and he's driving, but he's this point looking at the passenger side, and he's screaming and yelling, and he's got one hand in the wheel, and he'll just, his head's shaking, and like, that guy's angry, violently angry, telling his spouse or whoever it was, because I didn't see who it was in, in the seat next to, uh, next to him, but he was violently angry at them and letting them know that he was the boss, that it was going to be his way, and that he'd slow down and keep at it, you know, with his fingers and, and all of that. That's how Paul said he was, violently arrogant, you know. Um, not a place, good place to be because uh, people fear you. People don't want to talk to you. They don't want to have fellowship with you. We have uh, allowed <clears throat> uh, this building to be used for voting in the past. And um, there was one year when they were setting up and we moved all the chairs out and they brought in all their voting uh, booths and so forth. <clears throat> and there was this couple, and this guy was probably Robert's size, pretty tall guy, maybe Jack's size too. And his wife was very short, probably a little shorter than my wife. And I could see how fearful she was of him. And, and when he would walk in, he wouldn't do anything. He would tell her, get that table, go put it over there. No, put it this way and put it that way. You know, and, and he ruled her that way. And she's like, yes, okay, okay. And I'm like, wow, you could see the fear in, in her eyes. That's not how you want to treat a person. And that's, that's not productive and it's not healthy for the relationship at all. And sadly to say, um, he did that the whole time. And she just tried to smile and you knew it was a forced smile. She just got used to living that way with this individual. And that's not good. Paul said he was violently uh, uh, arrogant and the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundantly so you can see why he would say <laughs> the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundantly with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus because God had abundant grace towards the Apostle Paul just as he asked towards all of us this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the chief of sinners why would Paul say that? Paul recognized his sinfulness, his arrogance. He recognized who he was in the past. Sometimes the, the worse sinner you are, the greater Christian you are when you get converted because you recognize how bad you were, how sinful 
you were. And you're so appreciative that God opened up your eyes and saved your soul. And so you want to do as much as you can to repay him. But you know it'll never be repaid out of appreciation. So he goes on, however, for this reason I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long sufferings as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. And so Paul is saying, I'm an example. I'm the chief of all sinners. I recognize that. I put myself in that place. And I hope that because of that and God's long suffering towards me, people will see the grace of God in me and through me. <clears throat> so we are, as Paul said in another book, we're little epistles, right? And people are reading us. They're watching us. They're watching our character. They watch how we respond to things. And so it's important that we're in prayer, seeking God, and that we're trusting in Him and putting our faith in Him so that we can respond in a right way and, and be a pattern for those that walk around us. Now to the King eternal, mortal, invisible, to God, who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. I think at that moment when he realized that God had put him into the ministry, and yet he was a blasphemer, an insolent man, and yet God's uh, grace was on him, all of a sudden he just started shouting out in praise, thinking, oh, wow, praise God, eternal, immortal, invisible, God alone who is wise and be honor and glory forever and ever, amen. And he just got excited. Then he says, this charge I commit to you, son, Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, having faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected concerning the faith, have suffered shipwrecked, of whom are Hygemus, Alexander, whom I delivered to Satan, that, may, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Well, here's a couple of guys that got into big trouble with Paul. Delivered one over to Satan, himself, just like 1 Corinthians chapter 5, the couple that was sitting in the church, and he says, I delivered them over to Satan. So this was a this was a routine of Paul's, and say, I give them over to Satan, let Satan do what he wants, and hopefully they'll learn through that lesson. But Paul is charging Timothy here concerning prophecies that were given to Timothy concerning his ministry. So we don't have those prophecies. I don't know where they're at and what they said, but obviously they said something to the effect that Timothy would be a young pastor, that he would be a preacher of the gospel, and that he'd be effective within the church, and that he needed to fulfill that faithfully. And Paul's going to give us more descriptions. So these prophecies probably came from the Apostle Paul, or maybe from those around them through the gift of prophecy. We saw, what, a couple of weeks ago in Numbers, how God's Spirit came upon Moses and the men that he chose, and they began to prophesy you know, and even someone outside the camp that weren't there begin to prophesy. We see it in the in the New Testament and the Corinthians that prophecy is something that we should we should receive and not neglect it. It is a good gift and it should be within the church. But you always check prophecy with Scripture. It has to align itself with Scripture very clearly. Um, I remember um, going to um, a meeting with this one individual, a friend of mine. Well. Yeah, he was a friend of mine. <laughs> Interesting story. I'll tell you about it later. But uh, I was riding in the car with him, and he just he just asked me, so Reuben, when did you feel called to go into the ministry? And so I shared with him, I said, I never did. It's not something that I sought out. It's not something that I wanted. You know, I enjoyed my job, and I made good money, and there was no reason for me to go into ministry. And so God just put me in that place. He's the one that led me and guided me and started uh, moving in my life in that direction. And then I said, in fact, you, you were one of the guys that prophesied over me at a men's retreat that we had years ago. He goes, when? He says, you remember we were up in Arrowhead? You came out to teach at our church, some of the guys, and we were in the living room all sitting down. And then all of a sudden you were prophesying over people and then you laid your hands on me and you prophesied about God doing a work through me. And at the time I was just kind of like, okay, it, I don't know what kind of work. I guess maybe he's talking about the work I'm doing now, cleaning toilets and, you know, putting all the bulletins in order at the church and cleaning it and things like that. I thought maybe that's the good work I'm doing, but it was more than that. And he was like, wow, I do remember that day. You know, and it just made him uh, kind of 
and was taken back a little bit by it. But it was prophecy uh, that, uh, that led my heart, you know, to pursue that eventually down the road that when it happened, I could look back and say, yeah, Lord, you were leading me in that direction. When I had the opportunity to run a church for about eight months, I was in charge. The pastor got sick <clears throat> and he had to have a liver transplant. And for eight months, you know, he had to stay home, make sure it all took and medication and so forth. So I ran that church for eight months uh, with the help of Pastor Chuck and other pastors in Calvary that helped us uh, teach when I couldn't teach and, and so forth. And I remember, I remember the Lord opening a door so that I could have an extra day off. Uh, Edison at that time, if you remember, the AQMD offered incentives to companies to, um, to save uh, our, our planet from pollution. So if you could get your, your uh, employees to work four times a week instead of five, maybe 10 hour, 10 hour days and have a Friday off, that that would save pollution. They estimated how much it would save. And so Edison decided they were gonna do it because it was a high enough incentive. So we did that. So I was off on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday so I can uh, run the ministry. And I thought, wow, Lord, how interesting. Right when I needed it, you, you open up this door. But it gets better. And, and so um, it was still difficult. It was still hard. And I really needed one more day. And so Edison was going through uh, deregulation at the time. So they were trying to save money. So they offered the employees, look, we'll give you a day off without penalizing you. Because if you go under a certain amount of hours... They will, um, they will take away your benefits. They said, we won't take away benefits. We'll call it a planned vacation or planned time off. So that gave me another day off. So I was working three days a week at Edison and I was able to work Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, four days uh, that week um, at the church and, and take care of everything. And it happened exactly when I needed it. And this is what's interesting, that as soon as he came back, Edison said we can no longer offer that. It stopped, and it's never been. It's never happened again. Mm -hmm. You know, so I'm not saying it just happened for me, because God uses it for a lot of people for whatever reasons. You know, maybe they were sick, cancer, who knows? But I think He does things like that. You know, where He works it out for good, and it just it blew me away. So when I went full time into ministry, I knew I know I know you call me God, though I don't want to want to be here. I don't want to do this. I feel <laughs> like I'm not equipped. I feel my my language was even worse than it is now. You know, I just, I don't, Lord, no, please. <laughs> but he won, of course, because he's faithful. So prophecy is a, a good thing. And Timothy was prophesied over. So Paul's saying, so remember that, Timothy. You know, you have to fight the good fight because there's going to be some here, as he said, they're not going to agree with your calling. And there were some that didn't agree with my calling. And they says, no, God hasn't called you. You know, God hasn't called you at all. Others who come to the church and then they leave and they say, oh, this church is going to go under within a year. You know, here we are 25 years later, you know, and we own the building. Uh, a lot of churches don't own buildings. They're in schools and they're trying to find a building or they can't afford a building because to get a building today, something like this size, you're, you're talking about $3,000 a month. Easy. You go to a school, you're talking four or $5,000 a month to rent it for a Sunday and a Wednesday night. So you have to have a lot more people just to survive. And then it's not even yours. So you're, you're subject to the ones that own it. And this is ours, you know, and we pay less than $1,500 here for this whole place. And we remodeled pretty much the whole thing. So you just think about those things, at least from my perspective, and you go, wow, Lord, you are so good. I, I never would have imagined I would never would have imagined. And what we're doing in people's lives in the community and how effective we are here. And we've reached the community, you know, with forests, opportunities like that that have nothing to do with me. I'm just available. Whatever you want to do, Lord, and let me just lead as your people are being used by you. And God has done that faithfully. So he is good. So he encourages Timothy, just be faithful. You're going to have men that come against you, but just leave them to Satan. Leave them over to Satan and he'll do his, his bidding. Let's pray. <clears throat> Gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, for uh, the teaching this morning, Lord. Just encouragement, Father, for those of us that you have found faithful to put us in the ministry, Lord. And it's, been, it's been tough. It's been hard. I'm sure Timothy had a hard time, especially when those that uh, thought he wasn't called came up to him and said, you're not called of God. What are you doing here? You need to leave. 
And the same challenges today, Lord, 1,500 churches are closing every month. Pastors, 90% of pastors are under stress and are uh, suffering anxieties, Lord. It, it's a hard ministry, Lord, and your people need strength and protection and your power, Father. They need your anointing, Lord, and they need, they need the people's prayers, Father, to help them to get through um, the call of God in their lives because there's so many that are opposing them, Father. And then there's so many loved ones that oppose them, Father, that doesn't help to add to the rest of the stress, Lord. But Lord, it was only by your grace and by your empowering, Lord, that you allow us to continue on, Father. And we thank you for that, Lord. Bless my brothers and sisters as they begin their day today, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. If you have any prayer requests, we're gonna, we will be praying in a moment here. So uh, write your prayer requests or private message me and we will pray for you. Or I will pray for you silently without letting anyone know. Have a great day.